Hello and welcome to Joe and Paul's Another Mining Podcast with me, Paul Harris, and Joe Mazumdar. Hey, Paul, how's it going? Very well. Very busy week. Lots going on. Third quarter results, COP26 in Glasgow. And uh, with that as the, the theme this week, I have great pleasure in introducing our guest, Mark Fellows, a fa- co-founder and CEO of Scan Associates. Hi, Mark. Hi. Hi, Paul. Hi. Hi, Joe. Thanks for having me. Yeah, COP26 in Glasgow about climate change and what governments and the world leaders are doing about that. Mining's a, a, an element there. Mining's going to, on one hand, provide the materials that a lot of people think are going to be needed to fight uh, climate change, decarbonisation, electrification, that kind of things. And mining is also a source of greenhouse gas emissions in and of its own right. So we're going to get into that uh, with Mark. Um, Scan Associates is making a, a name for itself for the past couple of years. Uh, by producing carbon curves about mining operations uh, for various different metals, including aluminium, copper, gold, iron ore, and some other things besides. Um, Mark, perhaps start off by telling us a little bit more about SCARN and what you do. Sure. Thanks, Paul. Um, we're um, a young business. We, Although we've been in existence for about four years, it's only over the past two years that we've refocused ourselves um, to look at the the connection between ESG and and mining, and we look at that in a very analytical, numerically driven way at the mine by mine level. And the background is that all of us involved in the business are mining analysts, so we, we're mining mining industry people. Um, between us, we've got a you know a lot of experience um, looking at mining operations, uh, but previously looking at the economics of the industry. So we've all got backgrounds with businesses, um, businesses that are really known for creating industry cost curves and, and those kind of mind by mind economic analyses. But we realize that this, the big strategic issue facing the industry over the next 10, 20 years is gonna be energy and the low carbon transition. And also a whole bunch of other ESG related topics like water, land use, biodiversity. And many of those things actually lend themselves to our kind of mining analysts numerical approach. If you look at um, carbon emissions, they're driven by energy inputs. If you understand the mining method, the process method, the scale of the operation, where's the electricity come from? You can actually benchmark all those things. Um, You can then turn that into a, a carbon emission estimate. And you can then reconcile those things with the numbers that companies are reporting, because obviously companies are now widely reporting their carbon emissions and in some cases their their, their energy inputs as well. So our business is really about doing that. And so far, we've covered around two and a half thousand assets across nine commodities, um, which is probably five, six hundred companies owning those assets. And we've put those together into a bunch of um, greenhouse gas intensity curves. Uh, for each commodity, which are becoming um, increasingly the industry standard, I think it's fair to say, um, amongst the, 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 the particularly the major mining companies. But it's also, you know, we've had a lot of uptake with the smaller guys too. Uh, the financial institutions, royalty companies, governments, all of them are, uh, you know, are, 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 are consumers of our work now. So I, I remember, Mark, from when I worked uh, for Newmont and before that Phelps Dodge, uh, uh, Mark uh, worked, uh, I believe, with uh, uh, Brook Hunt, and then with uh, uh, with the onset of Brook Hunt, and 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 uh, the way they did it was understand how many liters of diesel you use, how many kilowatts of hours of power, and blah blah blah, and all of that goes in not into your cost anymore, though it would, but now into your uh, carbon equivalent emissions, but. You had like before a C1, a C2, and a C3 cost uh, in terms of cash costs for companies. And now you've generated a different costing schedule for uh, for uh, for mining companies. So could you go through, so, uh, you know, uh, your clients, so how do you look between these different uh, cost profiles or, uh, sorry, uh, carbon equipment emissions, emissions profiles? profiles. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so we have come up with a, our own in, in-house metric, which we've designed to be um, reflective of the way the mining 
industries supply chains work and we call it our headline metric we call e1 um, rather than c1 and, and e1 is based on the very widely used now um, ghg protocol methodology which is you'll hear people referring to scope one scope two and scope three emissions um, so we're building on those scope one scope two scope three classifications but what we're doing is we're we're drawing a boundary in our in, in our numbers in our reporting um, which covers um, the whole mining operation from rock in the ground through the mining process the on-site ore processing uh, in the case of the base metals the shipping of the concentrate to the smelter the smelting and the refining all the way up to refined metal so that's the e1 reporting boundary using our methodology and in the ghg protocol terms that includes components of scope one which is your mine site um, fuel usage so mostly diesel um, in effect your scope two which is your purchased energy which is effectively electricity and your some components of scope three so um, scope three is the, the stuff outside your boundary of control as a miner uh, and in our case that refers to the freight and uh, the concentrate freight and the smelting and refining so so we we refer to that as e1 and we produce a bunch of um, commodity specific um, carbon intensity metrics um, for each of the each of the commodities which we can then plot up as curves which look similar to cost curves um, along your horizontal axis you have production and each bar within the curve is a it represents an asset uh, we rank them in order of increasing carbon intensity which is the vertical axis this thing's easier to look at than explain and yeah. then you end up with a curve and you can say well okay my mine is very low carbon intensity it sits in the left hand low carbon end of the curve uh, or my mine is high carbon intensity it sits on the right hand side um, and we you know typically miners will by our products to show where their operations sit on the curve and also demonstrate how they're going to hopefully move them down the curve as they decarbonize. And likewise, the financial institutions use this as a way of, um, of, of representing where assets they may be considering investing in or promoting an M&A deal um, involving where they sit on the curve and obviously to try and um, benchmark their um, transactions, their portfolios. So I'm seeing a lot more of these sort of curves and it's typical of any mining company when they put out a presentation, if they have low costs, they'll show you a cost curve. If they're high grade, they'll show you where they show on the high grade part. If they don't show you one thing, it's because they don't have it. But the guys that do have and then show up in the lower quartile of, of your curve, they'll publish that figure. So if we go into scope one, are all companies the same in terms of mining assets, in terms of the, the trucks and the mining activity? There's not much comparative advantage, advantage in scope one? What tends to differentiate companies or mines from one another with regard to scope one? Um, obviously, there's a big difference between underground and open pit operations. Okay. And um, open pits can be, it can be very, uh, uh, um, sorry, underground mines, it, it can be very variable. Um, you can you you get some underground mines which have a re relatively low diesel consumption. Um, they're mostly electrified. Uh, you can have some uh, which are actually very high. Um, they might have a very extended underground infrastructure and be using lots of uh, mobile equipment underground and trucking up a, a decline ramp. So you know it just really depends. In the case of the open pit mines, what drives their carbon intensity, their scope one carbon intensity, how much diesel they use? is essentially the strip ratio, the scale of the mine. Obviously, you get some advantage from using very large trucks as opposed to small trucks in terms of the fuel consumption per tonne of rock. Uh, haul distances, you know, how far away from your pit is your waste dump or your process plant? Are you using an in-pit conveyor, uh, crusher and conveyor? Yeah. That can have a big input influ influence. But also, when you look at the, the, the intensity, the carbon intensity per... Um, per ounce of gold or per ton of copper, the big driver is grade. If you've got a low grade mine, you're going to be mining and processing um, a, a lot more rock per unit of gold or copper or nickel output 
And so consequently, that's a huge driver of the carbon intensity per ton of metal. So uh, let's take that just to uh, uh, some examples. And so, you know, when we look at a remote project in a place that requires diesel or heavy fuel oil or what have you, versus a project that's much lower grade, but has hydropower, um, you know, how, how, do you, uh, how do you quantify that? Because even though it's hydropower, you know, uh, they have to move a lot more material than something that's, that, that's higher grade. And so that all comes out a bit, uh, in your E1? It does. So you'll find you could have, and what you're describing there, if you've got a, a low grade mine, but it's, it it's, um, has the advantage of hydropower, what you might see there is its scope one emissions are relatively high because yeah. it's using a lot of diesel per ounce of gold production or pound of copper, but it's scope two emissions, as in its electricity um, carbon emission, will be very low right. um, because obviously hydropower has an almost negligible um, carbon output per kilowatt hour of electricity. So you end up with a very sort of um, heterogeneous population in terms of that mix between scope one and scope two emissions. Can I sort of jump in there? I mean, it's obviously very difficult to retrofit an existing mine and, and change how it was designed and planned to take on board this, this, this new paradigm, this new way of viewing the world. But um, obviously for future mine developments, this is going to be the case that you can perhaps factor in the use of different equipment, um, taking advantage more of uh, hydroelectricity or whatever. Um, you can plan your haul routes differently, maybe to use trolley assist. Um, but are you starting to see these kind of things coming through in mining plans and what companies say they're, they're going to do and how they're going to do it, you know, adjust to this great new world? Absolutely. And even smaller companies now are, um, are considering quite fundamental changes to their mine design and their mine infrastructure um, to, to install things like holly, uh, trolley assist or um, conveyor systems. Um, and obviously things like so solar um, solar arrays, wind farms, all of that stuff. Um, but this is going to be one of the really fascinating knock-on effects of decarbonisation. And it's going to have a real root and branch impact on the way mines operate. Um, and mines are going to be optimised at the design stage for a whole different set of parameters because traditionally your engineering um, consultant would optimize your mine plan to maximize the NPV or at least that's what they were supposed to do quite often they'd be maximizing they'd be optimizing your mine plan for the chief executive's idea of what was best for the share price I would I would argue which that's that's a diff, that's a different that's a different conversation but <laughs> the what will happen in future is mines will be designed wherever possible for things like um, your your um, ore haulage to be. So when your trucks are loaded, you'll want them to be traveling downhill rather than uphill. Now, obviously, that only works if you're mining some mining somewhere with that elevation difference and you're taking, uh, you know, an ore body that's perched on top of a hill. That, that's going to be very advantageous. But there's also going to be um, a lot of changes in terms of um, power infrastructure. Mines are going to need um, mines which currently have not connected to the grid, but which for, for whom it's an option, we're going to be wanting to connect to the electricity grid. Mines which are already on the electricity grid are probably going to want to double at least their, um, their electricity consumption. So they're going to have to upgrade the infrastructure to facilitate that. Um, if you're going to be look, putting in something like trolley assist or conveyor systems, you could well be redesigning the whole mining schedule. Um, it's going to have real root and branch impact. And the other big kicker here is that for many operations, particularly those with short mine lives or for which the economics are already a bit marginal, they're not going to be viable in terms of decarbonisation. It's just not going to make sense to spend vast amounts of money um, buying hydrogen fuel cell or battery electric haul trucks um, if your mine life is restricted to five years. You really need 
probably a 15 year my life to justify it. And many operations do not have that. And obviously the pressure that they're gonna be under is gonna come through, through carbon taxation, through um, investors disinvesting, um, because many of the big uh, institutional investors will have a mandate to disinvest from companies that aren't decarbonizing rapidly enough. And this is gonna have a massive impact. I mean, ultimately it's gonna knock, have a knock-on effect on the availability of supply and on the um, balance between supply and demand and commodity prices. So we're looking at something that's gonna have a massive impact on our industry over the next 20 years. And imagine so, specifically in gold, because gold mine lives tend to be shorter than, let's say, a copper mine life. So that could really absolutely. put the cat amongst the pigeons there. And if you've got a very narrow, vertically dipping ore body, it's just not economically viable to drill 10 years ahead worths of reserves. It's just not geometrically possible in some cases. So what do you do? It's going to be very, very interesting. And then add to that, that I mean, obviously, copper is part of the decarbonization um, solution as a commodity. It's going to be in you know, demand growth, massive demand growth just to put in all that electrification infrastructure but that the world needs. Gold is a more discretionary product and there's already you know, uh, many decades worth of physical consumption sat in bank vaults around the world. Um, you know, there are a lot, of, um, a, lot, a lot of people out there might be thinking, well, an easy way to cut the carbon emissions from gold is to stop mining it. Um, so the gold mining industry is going to be under a lot of pressure to be, to be at the forefront of decarbonisation. And I think that penny is starting to drop. Actually, I really do. I think, the, you know, many of the more progressive thinkers in the gold mining industry uh, are starting to realise that. So um, when I worked for uh, Newmont, you know, electrification was a big deal, uh, you know, to get on the grid. But but the other problem is that that might help you maybe at one part of your cost or sorry, your carbon emission, but then it might hurt you later because the power might be derived from, you know, a, a fuel, natural gas or yeah. coal power. And, and you see that on the emissions and the scope um, one, you know, scope three emissions from, you know, Chinese producers, but also, you know, when, when they talk about electrification in Nevada, because a lot of that is natural gas and, and still some coal there that they don't look that good, even if they electrify their trucks. No, yeah, you're absolutely right. And it, it's kind of a similar situation to we have here in terms of the, the, the power supply in the UK generally. Um, we had a big switch over from coal to natural gas back in the through the course of the 80s and the 90s. And, and that's given us a bit of a head start on decarbonisation. But the next phase has to be moving away from gas too. Um, and Nevada, as you say, is still in transition from coal. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, those big power stations um, that serve the um, coal in operations, they're, they're, they're in the process of switching those over, or at least partly over to gas. But there's another transition yet to come. And the, the real kicker for those Nevada gold ops is they're also very energy intensive because you've got a lot of refractory material. Yeah. It's going into autoclaves. It's going into roasters. Um, uh, you've got some underground mines there that are, a fairly power intensive as well. Um, the open pits are pretty big and the strip ratios are pretty high. Um, so consequently, those things plot up at the high end of the carbon curve um, and decarbonizing them is going to be kind of uh, expensive. Um, but at least, um, well, yeah, we could talk an awful lot about um, the pros and cons of um, exploration too far in advance of production in, the, in, in Nevada. Um, but it's, that's going to be one of the decisions, you know, is, um, is it worth investing all this money? I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sure it, it will be, but it's an interesting so conundrum. One advantage with gold is that it produces almost the refined product at site. And so sure. your scope three emissions don't apply to gold and silver usually, no. unless no, no. it's in a concentrate. But so scope three is when you really start tacking on the smelting, refining, the freight. And so how does that look like? And, and, and that's something that um, 
hard to control for a mining company who doesn't want to be involved in the smelting business. It, it is. Um, and if you look at something like copper, um, the, those downstream emissions, so the emissions associated with um, shipping that concentrate off-site um, to, and the, the, the emissions associated with smelting and refining, um, account for, I think, something like 35% uh, or thereabouts of, of the total emissions through to refined metal. Um, and as you say, the miner does not have control over those things. The only control the miner has is in um, maybe having some choice of which smelters to send the material to. But that choice is fairly limited um, in reality in that most of the smelting and refining capacity has become concentrated in China. And China is predominantly um, coal-fired power. Um, and this issue is a massive one when you look at, say, aluminium, where over the last couple of decades, we've seen huge growth in aluminium smelting capacity in China uh, and a huge growth in coal-fired power um, stations to supply those aluminium smelters, which are essentially just huge electricity freezing factories. Um, and, you know, consequently, the carbon emission associated with aluminium just dwarfs the rest of the mining sector um, completely. Um, and until China gets a real go on decarbonizing its coal-fired power stations, that's not going to change. Um, so, so much really does hinge on China. I mean, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because uh, obviously aluminium is one of the, as with copper, it's one of the uh, infrastructure materials for transmission mm. of electricity. And it's a lightweighting material. You know, if you, want a, if you want an efficient car or whatever it is, you, you know, use lots of aluminium because it, it's, it's more energy efficient to drive around. You know, so yeah, absolutely. The, the other problem I see is that there's this gap in terms of where we want to end up and where we are right now. Mm. So uh, the problem is that if we capital invest for a world that we foresee in 2030, 2050, but the reality of the world right now, and, and I see that in the coal industry. So even though we're all negative about coal or energy, oil and gas, those are the commodities that are doing the best right now, you know, because nobody wants it, but they still need it. Yeah, it's yeah. true. Um... And as you say, do you, what happens if you just stop investing in, in fossil fuels right now? Well, obviously that just can't, can't happen yet. Um, so yeah, we're in a really interesting transition. And I think um, if you, the scary thing is, and, and this was the kind of epiphany I went through, was I actually took the time to read some of the, the science um, and realize that actually we are genuinely on a path towards um, the higher end of the projections in terms of global warming. And we're also facing a really difficult um, task if we are going to decarbonize. Uh, you realize we are really in a very tight spot here. But on the other hand, um, you have to have some hope that humanity can sometimes do surprisingly positive things very quickly and i think we're at a really absolutely pivotal moment right now and it's going to be very interesting to see how the next few years pan out um and i know everybody's very um alert to the the fact that cop 26 may be mostly greenwashing maybe mostly companies just saying one thing and doing another completely agree um, but I, 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 I don't think that can continue forever. It can't. Uh, and the really progressive companies are seeing the opportunity here. And there is an opportunity. These things do actually start to make economic sense. And obviously, increasingly so, as decarbonizing technologies get some scale to them. You know, they become cheaper. Um, and already many of the um, many of these technologies with application to the mining sector, we're starting to get to that point. You know, you can see how the economics will make sense. It's just going to be tough on some of those marginal mines with short lives. Um, 
So. I think you can start see you can see that very much in the the scope too. A lot of mining companies that are uh, switching out to sort of uh, renewable energies, they're you know they're doing it because they're reducing the scope too, but they're also getting uh, reduced costs with that yeah. as well. And in many ju jurisdictions, switching to a a, a renewable um, grid power supply through a power purchase agreement, it's actually no more expensive, or it's even cheaper than being anchored to a coal-fired um, power producer. So you know these technologies are, are they're scaling and they're coming down in, in in cost. All of this is obviously going to be already starting to make an impact in many many different ways. Um, certain jurisdictions or starting to implement carbon taxes. Uh, British Columbia, for example, is uh, one of the sort of leading jurisdictions there. Um, and are we approaching a time when we start seeing sort of carbon costs appear in company quarterly results, balance sheets, that kind of thing? I, 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 we are, for sure. Um, we're already hearing this from clients. Uh, and in the case of some of the Canadian producers, they're concerned that carbon taxes are ultimately going to be uh you know 25 30 percent plus of their um of their cost base um so yeah it's gonna it's gonna have a real impact okay and so um obviously one way you know one mechanism to reduce on paper at least sort of carbon emissions buying carbon offsets um do you see that as is that a long term fix, a short term fix? Is that just companies trying to dodge the issue? Will investors clamp down on that and say you've got to come up with a better solution than just buying credits offsets? There's a there's a lot of skepticism um, out there um, in in the you know I'm, I'm talking about the world at large now about offsets and I think quite rightly so um, and even the companies the reputable companies selling offsets are saying um you know what we're not selling you this as the permanent solution we're selling you this offset um as something that will um reduce your stated co2 emissions while you get your act together and and, and permanently decarbonize and i think there's a, a fairly widespread recognition that that is the role if you like of of offsetting and that there are it's just not feasible to plant enough trees in the world to really be a long-term solution. Um, so, yeah, and there's all sorts of issues around the credibility of individual offsets. You know, how who signs off on those? Yeah. Are they fundamentally sound? Um, it becomes a bit like a cryptocurrency. It does. It, we, yeah. Well, yeah, it, exactly. I think that's a good analogy. Like it, it's so so just to wrap up like how do you think like you've got like a client base you were telling you of just not only producers but developers and and then also um, you know across industries aluminum gold base metals blah 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 and then also you're getting the uh, investors that invest in these companies and so are they all looking at it from different perspectives or are they all just looking at how to, okay, how do I look at, you know, this one's high, so no, this one's low, so good. It, but they, that's only one lens, right? Or is that the lens now? Um, we are genuinely seeing carbon intensity and position on the carbon curve becoming one of the factors that's taken into consideration when banks look at financing something, um, when investors look, the institutional investors look at buying into something, when companies look at a potential M&A transaction, um, they're taking this into account. So it's, it's, it's material from that point of view. Then there's obviously the reporting issue with TCFD and companies being required by um, the um, exchanges to actually report their emissions and in some cases to put those in the context of their competitors as well and and you know are you higher than lower than your peer group so yeah this there's various it's not just one driver uh, and then you have i mean the, the 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 major mining companies they're obviously um they work on long time scales and they they think about 
um, strategy and a lot of depth, as you know, Joe, from your um, career, you, you know, your job is to look 30 years into the future, look at the assets we have, the assets we may have. And, and this is one of those factors that's now being planned into that stuff is, well, you know, how are you going to decarbonize it? Is it going to, is it going to stick out in our portfolio as something that we, you know, we're struggling to decarbonize? Um, and how's that going to play with our investor base? Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's genuinely being, uh, you know, taken into account from lots of different angles there. Okay, Paul? No, that's, uh, I think that's all for me. I think, um, you know, uh, it is going to become a, a, an increasingly discriminating factor. Um, I guess from an investors, they, they want to back the right horses. And so capital will flow to the, the best horses, the best performing ones, both financially and increasingly on their an environmental performance. I would guess on the capital asset allocation basis, as, as Mark is talking, like it will impact uh, investment decisions, M&A potentially going forward. Cause Cost like of you capital look at as well. Yeah, and then we see a lot more of these ESG bond links uh, uh, that companies are taking on. And so uh, obviously what, what Mark's doing and other independent analysts are doing uh, is going to weigh in on how they actually, you know, it's not just about where you sit on that curve is where you're going to sit on that curve as, as you within that bond uh, time frame. So a lot of interesting things from a capital al asset allocation and potentially um, decisions going forward. More uncertainty for the mining industry, and but if we taper production, then that can only be higher commodity prices, I would think. Well, yeah. very, very interesting times, and I, I think you're right. It, the, it, in many ways, the future outlook for commodities is, is very positive. Price is probably going to continue trending up. Lots of challenges, but the mining sector always has lots of challenges. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> okay well, yep. <laughs> well this has been a fascinating discussion about us you know the new paradigm that's here with us now and it's going to continue uh, well into the future so thank you very much mark fellows of scan associates for joining us thank you thank you for having me guys really enjoyed it uh, joe mazumdar and i'm paul harris from joe and paul's another mining podcast <laughs>